She woke. Panic shot through her. Not the nightmares of Equestria consumed in balefire, but rather the feeling one gets when they have slept through their alarm and are certainly going to be late. Her hoof swiped desperately for her alarm clock, and by the time she was awake enough to see she was holding a rock, she remembered the world ending. Oh. Oh. Celestia, damn it. She cringed as the fear returned, along with the aches and pains. It felt like only just yesterday that she'd come home from work to find the message on her answering machine. Like it was just yesterday when she heard the burst of gunfire and the little colt screaming for his mother. Just yesterday that she saw the balefire rise from the south. Felt the heat searing against her before they were lowered into the vault. She froze, her mind glancing back at the image. She had not seen that. She was unconscious for that event, or so she thought. Her logic shot up front and center in her mind, telling her that she was not unconscious but in shock. This let her see the event and record it in her memories without realizing what she saw. She got to the stable elevator somehow. Obviously, she was stronger inside than she knew, and it just took a little bit of shock and head trauma to bring it bubbling to the surface. Head trauma. That feathered jerk hit me! She rubbed her forehead with a hoof. Clearly, she could feel the swollen lump and feel the pain. She had little doubt, and both her eyes were blackened, from such a heavy strike. For such a small griffin, he hit very hard. It may have seemed like yesterday, but it was clear by the stable she just climbed out of, and the state of the dead world just outside, that it had been at least ten years. Her mind spun, and she winced the moment she put her glasses back into the bridge of her nose. Another miracle that they were not broken. The panic inside stirred, but didn't take over. She just needed something to focus on and the logical part of her brain quickly stepped in. Depending on how many megaspell detonations, the disbursement of the impact zones and other smaller variables, with this much radiation just about everywhere, it could have been anything from 10 to 400 years, give or take. If the rumors were true on numbers versus viable targets, with this much radiation it should have been about 15 years? Yes, that does sound right. She clopped her hooves together. Logical Lexi was her favorite Lexi, especially when she needed to take her mind off things like the war, MOM inspections, and now the world ending. She was always happy, she was a smart pony, and these little habits made life a little easier. Just as she had the logical Lexi she kinda hated, scared Lexi. It was her least favorite. She hated feeling helpless. She was never a fighter and never intended to become one. But sheer logic and strategy gave way to give her a leg up, and a hoof in the door over any pony else. Had she been a unicorn like her mother, she would have been at the heart of the Ministry of Magic. She knew that much, at the very least. At least, she'd always been confident that she didn't need to be brave or strong or have power. Her mind was all the muscle she needed. That is, until the world ended. But confidence was still very helpful. Standing up, she still felt all the soreness combined with the pain in her face. However, what caught her attention was a note that fluttered in her face with her bangs. Some pony, or some griffin, had pulled her bobby pin out and used it to secure a note to her now loose mane. It took a fair bit of time to get her mane back to its simple high ponytail. Most of the time was spent envying all unicorns and their magic versus her own annoying hooves. Since, when she was yet again able to get her own standards, she opened the note. For a creature with opposable thumbs, that griffin has terrible handwriting. She cleared her throat and peered over the messy note. Dear stupid mud pony, I would say that I'm sorry for headbutting you, but I'm not a liar. I'm not sorry because you're annoying. But sorry feels like something you would want me to say, so sorry, I guess. Now, firstly, I'm assuming you have brain damage, or have been living under a rock, not knowing which way is around. Which is why I took the time to write this note. Please note that headbutting you was better than shooting you. Go south for Shantytown. West for Pasternville. Pasternville is further, but you'll have everything you need there. 
However, in Shantytown, you should be able to get the general layout of who is who and what is what, so you don't die horribly after the first night in the wasteland like the stupid mud pony you are. P.S. If you got bottle caps, next time start with trying to hire me, rather than appeal to my sense of morality. Lexicon grumbled and crinkled up the note in her hooves before tossing it to the ground. She was so upset that she almost didn't hear the beep from her new pep buck. Looking it over, she could clearly see two locations showing on the map. She blinked. She knew how advanced the magic was within these things, but she did not quite grasp what kind of magic could possibly pick up the location of a place from just its name being said or read. Such things usually required a great deal of pre-programming, like the technology knowing the information before listing it. It was a little impossible things like this that drove her up the wall. But having her division being inspected by the Ministry of Morale a few times already, she'd seen the downright frightening powers of its Ministry Mayor. She could deal with the mystery. Hell, she could and would rather deal with just about anything over spending even 12 seconds around the pink Mayor. Even the most illogical, nonsensical, garbage-chaos-filled impossibilities seemed easier to accept than half the crap that came out of the infamous Ministry Mayor of the Ministry of Morale. She swatted herself, remembering to focus. She needed logical Lexi at the moment. Grumbling and trying to focus, she killed the panic and remembered that, with the number of logical targets and the amount of residual radiation left over, clearly there had to be something left of Equestria. She just needed a few things first. Okay. Pasternville has a decent-sized city. Not huge, but it's an okay size. Not big enough or important enough for a balefire bomb, and... She grinned eagerly. I can check on home. Sure, a few years with desperate looting ponies might leave it a little rough, but no pony can get through that lock in the safe room to my library. Despite everything, logical Lexi left her feeling like she was on top of the world, or at least what was left of it. The trip to the stable was just about five minutes by hoof back to the world ended. She was a little unsure where to go from here, but she had faith that her pip buck beeped, and she took a look at the map where something tagged home just showed up. She growled, remembering the oddness that the old pink pony in relation to the all-knowing technology of the pip buck. In the end, she just let out an explosive sigh and started towards her home. The map said it was just about a half-hour walk from Pasternville, and only a two-minute walk from where her current location was at. She had quite a plan, though. Assuming that her neighbor was not still alive, or no pony else came by and looted all of what she needed for her plans. The walk was difficult, not because of the terrain was rough or she was ill-equipped, but because the every moment her new pit buck gave so much as the slightest click, Lexi would let out a sharp eep and go ten steps back trying to mentally map out the radiation. This cycle of forward and backwards ended up turning a two-minute trip into a half-hour trip. Her mind was brimming with all manner of thoughts and fears. The complete disarray of the world around her could mean very few things. Either her calculations were off, which were as unlikely, or Equestria was a nation that had sit upon quite an extensive extreme to not have teams of ponies actively engaging in some sort of cleanup. And then again, Canterlot was sure to be one of the primary targets for the Mega Spell detonations. Perhaps the princesses were injured, or Celestia forbid, no longer with us. She gave a shudder as she continued on with caution. Well, obviously, regardless of their status, they would not be able to restore anything so far north within the first few decades. I can't think of any other reason why slavery would be allowed to become a thing again, unless that stupid bird was lying. And the note did say he wanted bottle caps, and perhaps it's a crazy griffin currency. I imagine that Equestria is so horribly damaged in the war, bits have fallen out of fashion. Not to mention, rather rare. Then again, everything equestrian would be rather rare after a dozen or so mega spells and the hoarding which would occur after such an event. Something as common and generally worthless as bottle caps would make a great impromptu currency. But if any pony got the old spark cola factories up and running, they could just pass uh, mass print money. Oh, unless the current equestrian efforts are spent maintaining and guarding the factories, 
That would explain a lot. After all, it's smartest to expand slowly and surely. Can't have another resource problem by rapidly expanding. Just take care of our nation slowly. She giggled with glee at logical Lexi's reasoning, despite the aching feeling that she was ignoring a few factors for her own comfort. She smiled happily, feeling quite accomplished. Regardless of the situation, she knew she needed to get her hooves on some bottle caps and stay low. Perhaps she could get to Pasternville, and from there she would learn just how things had progressed in Equestria, and how to get to civilization. This far up north she was sure to find not much in terms of civilization. There had not been much up here before the war, and honestly, aside from a few trade routes and cities or research centers, the northernmost parts of Equestria was still just a little wild. She continued gingerly, until things started to look familiar. Groves of dead trees and crumbling buildings. The logical Lexi seemed agitated, yelling at her from inside her own head. Something of the place seemed to disagree with her. However, that went right out the window when she saw what could only be salvation. Right there, just outside her old housing district, there was a fresh camp. Not only a fresh camp, but an icon she knew very well. An apple, gears, and sword. Ah, Applejack Steel Rangers. At last, some pony civilized. She had some level of experience with them before the bombs fell. She was, after all, in the Ministry of Wartime Technology, and they came through the research facility all the time. Finally, I can see some civilization and decency. Not to mention, I can get into my library and salvage what I can in preparation for the trip. She knew Project Burbonum wasn't likely to be very useful to the world in its current state, but it would be useful eventually. It didn't take very long to get further into the apartment complex. It was not, it was in total ruin, to the point where she began to have some slight doubts on her time in the stable theory. The math did not lie, but there was certainly a chance her statistics were compromised by outside variables. But she still wanted so badly for there to be an Equestria left out there somewhere for her to return to. She pushed the doubts and her theory into the back of her mind as she continued, searching for Applejack's rangers. Her mind burned with the eagerness, hoping to finally get out of this horrible wasteland and back into a library where she could study and continue strengthening Equestria with her work into the ancient past. No pony was at the campsite, but she held up her hope. There were signs that the area was being searched. Door frames were broken and not weathered by along with fractures. So the doors had to have been destroyed or broken down at least very recently, and the camps had not been cleared up yet. But there had to have been a reason that the rangers were not currently here. If she remembered correctly, she had never seen less than two of the armored soldiers in the area at the same time. At each of the present encampments, there had to have been at least five. Considering the amount of gear present, it was most likely double or even triple that, just to ensure that they would have one shift sleeping at all times and they would need some more able bodies to move everything. However, the tents were empty, so it was most likely just a double, or something important was happening. She smiled happily at her logical breakdown as she continued her slow trot. Hey, the griffin said nonchalantly from inside his cage. Oh, hey. She continued to trot, but then stopped. She rubbed her head and looked back. Oh, hey! Wait, what are you doing here, and why are you in that cage? She pointed a hoof at him, needing to take a moment to realize it was the same young griffin from before. Kroos! Well, I tried to sneak a little too close, but the Steel Rangers caught me and threw me in here. But as for what I'm currently doing, honestly, I'm waiting for you to be caught, so they'll open the door to throw you in, and they'll give me the chance to stab him in the throat so I can try and fly away. But you know, waiting to can take a while, so how about you, mud pony? She face hoofed and composed herself before resorting to a few short questions. What do you mean the Steel Rangers put you in there? Are you working for the zebras? She felt odd letting the question roll off her tongue. Throwing around the Z word was always prompted a surprise MOM visit. His chest twitched as if he almost let a laugh escape. Zebras? Are you joking? Then explain why you're in a literal cage. 
The Ministry of Wartime Technology is not some comic book supervillain organization. The Steel Rangers would not put you in there unless you... She was promptly cut off as a sharp pain exploded in her head and everything went dark. Everything seemed hazy and there was a tremendous amount of pain in the back of her head. She could tell she was being pulled on and picked up before being placed gingerly back down. It took a little longer before she mumbled and looked up at the griffin. Lexicon rubbed the back of her head, wincing at the pain. She struggled to her hooves and glared angrily at him. Why did you hit me? The your stupid smirk behind his beak made her suddenly stop and ask herself how he hit her. It was then she noticed there were currently no bars between her and Kroos. She whipped about and adjusted her glasses to see a rather large pony in power armor. Ah, uh, hey, over here, let me out. She did not notice at first, but after a few seconds she took in a few more ponies in the area. Early one was wearing armor. The others were plainly wearing dingy uniforms. Most of them were young, but those who were not were clearly not fit for combat. Long, deep, potentially crippling scars over their bodies or very old age. A young mare spared her a worried look, but she was firmly pulled back to face front by the armored ranger. Don't pay the tribals any attention. You'll never make it to knighthood if you let your emotions conflict with your orders. His voice was deep, almost agitated sounding, clearly male. Lexicon took notice of her pip buck in the mare's hooves, but was more concerned with what the armored stallion said. Wait, what? Tribals? Lexicon tried to make sense of it, but defaulted to a more reliable choice outside of internal debating what some pony's words meant. All this was nonsense, so she would use the only thing she knew a civilized Ministry pony would respond to. Ministry of Wartime Technology, Level 2 Librarian Department, Project Burbonum, Serial Number 2903010491860. LM. Let me out of this damned cage! She huffed and stared out. She never had much authority, but knowing what to say to security usually got them to leave her alone. All the older ponies and the armored one turned around at that, causing her to smile with some hope. The armored stallion came closer and stared down at her. He towered over her, making her knees weak with a spike of fear. Where did you learn that? At work? It's my ministry ID code. Lexicon. 09 3010491860 I'm with the Ministry of Wartime Technology. She felt confident, but every second she stared up at the empty steel face of the ranger's helmet, she could feel that confidence melting away. That's impossible, which means that you are lying. So tell me how you came to know that information. A very, very large minigun at his side leveled with her face and began to spin up. Gross took two steps to the side with a sigh. The look on his face just said, I don't want your insides getting on my armor. Lexicon's ears folded back and her pupils shrank as she quickly tried to find a way out of the situation. Eh, it's true. I was just coming here to get to my safe room. I have supplies and my books in there. The minigun stopped spinning, but remained leveled at her. Number 278 of Building 15. His cold, motionless mask of a helmet stared down at her, and she did her best to nod. She did not want to question him or how he knew the exact number of her room. The others behind the ranger mumbled in surprise, but went silent when the ranger continued. What's the code to get in? Lexicon did not like this at all, but... Giving up her library was a lot less painful than getting turned into paste. Maybe after this, they would know she was telling the truth. LTG 35772A She shivered, unable to move from her spot, likewise unable to take her eyes off the minigun barrels. A sudden flood of relief shot through her as the barrels moved away from her. Scribbles! Watch them! Do not talk to them! The stallion's bulk moved briskly away from the cage. The young mare from before sat Lexicon's pit buck to a nearby table and nodded. All the others gathered a few things and quickly made their way towards Building 15, 
which despite how much had changed or become ruins, she remembered was just around the corner. But it didn't matter to her now. It was all just too overwhelming. She just slowly curled up and pouted in the cage. Project Barbonum? You were part of Project Barbonum? How? Lexicon looked up and nearly jumped back, seeing the mare's soft violet eyes looking at her. What, what do you mean, how? It's... Lexicon paused, looking over the debris and damaged the area. It could not have been 15 years. It had to have been longer. Maybe something like 30 or 40. That could account for the damaged surroundings and more. But that would mean that there would have been many more bombs than she thought. It's been more than 15 years, hasn't it? What's left of Equestria? The mare looked at her with wonder and a shade or two of sorrow. Her lips parted and she was about to speak when she flinched. Her eyes trailing up, she began to step back in fright. A paw landed firmly on Lexicon's head, pushing her face into the dirt and metal of the cage. Talons shot out and quickly wrapped over the face of the mare called Scribbles. There was a sudden quick twist and a wet snap before she fell to the ground, twitching. Lexi forced herself to her hooves, heaving and shivering. She had nothing in her to throw up, but nonetheless, this was something that would haunt her forever. Wh what's wrong with you? Shut it, mode pony. You're lucky I'm here. Kroos grumbled as he pulled Scribble's body in close and rifled through her saddlebags. It didn't take him long before frustration spread over his features, then fear showed up in his eyes. She... she didn't have the key. Fuck! Shit! 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 His talons raked across the bars in frustration. He continued even when his talons began to bleed. Though Lexi's outrage over the death fed her a little courage, and she spouted out, A key. You killed her for a key? The key to the cage. Without it, we can't leave. And they will come back and find her dead. They won't... Keep either of us very much longer after that. Damn it all. His paw kicked the steel doors. He was too angry to complain about the pain in his toes. Piercing together the logical outcome, Lexicon could only agree on a the death part. Soon the panic, just like from the minigun, returned. She whimpered, looking back and forth before she looked at the lock. A flood of hope filled her, and she pulled out one of her bobby pins with her hair, then swiped a small shard of metal off the ground. It was very difficult with just her hooves and mouth, but she twisted the metal in the lock to keep up tension, and inserted the slightly altered bobby pin into the locks. Wait, you know how to pick locks? Trust tried to see what she was doing with a fair amount of renewed hope. No. But I do have a very good understanding of physics, and I know how locks work. She twisted and pulled at it, but quickly fumbled and dropped the pin. Dang it. Okay, I think I have, um... He pushed her aside and grabbed the pin, electing to use his talons instead of the piece of metal. Walk me through it. You can't unlock it from this side using your mouth, mud pony. Now hurry up. It'll be out here any minute. She didn't like it, but she breathed a little easier. This is a cheap lock. It's only got three tumblers. You can tell by the length of the barrel. Just picture three poles that are all different lengths. Now, they are all resting inside of the holes. In order to unlock the lock, you have to push each pole until it's flush with the outside of the barrel. And keep the tension on the lock in order to catch the pins when they pop out. That is lock picking. The griffin asked skeptically, as if wondering why he never tried it before. It's physics. I know how locks work. After that, it's just knowing how to manipulate the moving parts in your favor to substitute the key. Just remember that it'll be under pressure, so you'll hear a click when you get the pin up. It did not take long at all before Kroos's talons rotated and he laughed. Well, look at that! He opened the door and quickly rushed over to rifle through a small crate and pulled his pistol and rest of his gear. Lexicon, too quick exited and grabbed her pip buck. She strapped it in place and shivered, looking back at Scribbles. I still can't believe you killed her. Welcome to the wasteland, mud pony. It's kinda how things go. 
The griffin chuckled and fed a magazine into the handle of his weapon, quickly racking the slide with a grin. But his grin vanished with a twitch, and he rapidly threw himself back into a stream of death shot out at him, tearing the spot he was standing at into a smoldering ruin. Lexicon dove and hid underneath a nearby table, set up for what looked like some sort of device, service station, or power armor. Looking around desperately, she tried her best to find a way to escape or stop the conflict, which in her own personal opinion would have been much easier if her legs were not petrified with fear. After having peeped under the table, all the poor mare could hear was rapid gunfire, punctuated by heavy caliber pistol returning fire. Before the bombs dropped, which for all she had experienced, this might as well not even have been yesterday, she had never even been within ten yards of a gun going off. The effect of the event exploding onward around her was a tad stressful, and at the moment she found her legs unwilling to move. In fact, the only thing she managed to do was pout, blubber, and try not to make noise loud enough for the rangers to hear. Wallowing in fear and paralysis did not get any better as a loud thump sounded. It was followed, quickly, as she watched the cage they had just escaped from explode, flying high, then crashing just out of her sight. The thing that drove her even further into fear was that Kroos had stopped firing. He was not so much her friend, but she knew that if he had wanted to kill her, he certainly would have a dozen times over, before and after the cage, which she couldn't say about the rangers. Heavy armored hoof falls sounded. Closer and closer they came. Lexicon struggled to breathe. She flinched at every step she could hear the ranger take. There was a loud crack and whir of a machine gun loading, hurling up her clenched eyes shut, demanding herself that she not make a single sound. But that went without, out the window as a large ranger pivoted his front legs and delivered a powerful apple buck to the table she was hiding under. The armor servicing station uprooted and tossed away as if it was a toy. She did the only thing she could. The one thing she had been trying not to do since the gunfire had begun. She screamed. The motor purred as the minigun began to spin. She refused to look. She could feel the heat coming off of it. Not even logical Lexi wanted to tell her just how far away that meant it was. She just sat there smelling the cordite and listening to the whirr and clicking. The ranger did not say anything. He just stood there as if waiting to see if she had any plans or last efforts. Clearly, she didn't. A torrent of gunfire sounded and she was unable to even flinch. But when the sound of a wet, meaty splatter accompanied by a heavy metal thud of the ranger hitting the ground filled her ears, she finally opened her eyes. Ah, hell yeah! Whoever made armor-piercing bullets, I could kiss you! Gross was pinned under the metal remains of the cage, but he had one arm free despite the extensive limited motion that he had and gotten his chance and just emptied his pistol into the back of the ranger's head. Lexicon was still in shock, just staring in fear. Cross did his best to try and clear his throat, to spit a bloody loogie, and then spoke as loudly as he could. You little fuckers want to avoid becoming like your metal buddy here? I highly suggest you leave. The others did not stick around after all rushing off as fast as they could. All the unarmored enemies quickly dashed off as fast as they could. Clearly, if they knew he was pinned and out of ammo, they would not have even considered leaving. But off they went. It was another thirty seconds or so before a Kroos called out to her. Hey, mud pony. A little help. She looked back over at him. She could barely even move, but still she barely managed to get her badly shaking hooves moving. Even more embarrassingly, she made the discovery that she had wet herself in the fight. Quickly as she could move, which was not very fast, she came closer, hardly able to pry her eyes off the dead. The ranger's head was a bloody pulp inside the spaghetti strainer of a helmet he wore. A little faster, please. There's a whole lot more of them. I have no idea when they're coming back. She took another step and felt something wet on her hooves. She cringed and tried not to fall over again, but she noticed the rags of the bloody mess that she had stepped in was the remains of scribbles, even more torn up in the firefight. Why? Because when they first captured me, I had to make up some BS about being able to break into a nearby stable. 
A lot of us know it's around here somewhere. But none of us gets the code for the door. I convinced them I had the code, so they sent most of their battalions off to the vault, and only Sunshine here and his scribes stayed behind. Despite being trapped and bleeding under the rubble and debris, he seemed rather cheerful. No. Why? Why did they have to die? Slowly, she felt something stronger get a hold of her. The same feeling that she had when she saw him cut off the slaver's head and break Scribble's neck. It was more outrage than despair and fear. What? Why did you have to kill them? Couldn't you have just knocked them out or something? Mud pony. I would love to have this talk with you right now. But sadly, we can't. We have much bigger things to do. We have to get going quickly. Now, help me out of this hole, and we can part ways. I'll never bother you again. Probably. He chuckled, but she shook her head. Pain still clear in her eyes. Look, I'm sorry. I don't know what rock you've been living under, but this is the wasteland. You either learn how to kill, or you run and die. There's a billion and one things out here that'll kill you. Whether it's because you might have loot, might be dangerous, or because it gets some raider's rocks off. They will kill you and not give a damn. You have to learn when to kill and when to run. That's just the wasteland. She leaned in, looking at him, her eyes still watering from the emotional overload. She stepped to one side and pointed a hoof at what used to be Scribe Scribbles. You... you killed her for a key. A key she didn't even have. She just wanted to ask me questions. Questions that would give me answers. She was even younger than me. And you just killed her outright. She didn't even have a chance. Perhaps. But that's just the wasteland. He shrugged with the one shoulder that was not pinned. The wasteland? She died just because it was convenient? Just because you thought it might have benefited you? Just like how you're currently inconvenienced? She gestured to all the debris pinning the young griffin. Gross's face clearly displayed that he did not like where this was going. They put me in a cage. They put you in a cage. They took our crap and caged us. They might as well be raiders. And they were going to kill us both the moment they confirmed whether or not we had anything valuable. Just let me out from under this crap. I'll even take you to Pasternville. First class bodyguard. I'll get you there in one piece. And you can do whatever you want once you're there, okay? He looked at her, into her eyes, but only saw the shock she was neck deep in. She looked practically hollow. But then that wouldn't be the wasteland. Her response was slow and sluggish, her eyes tearing up more, and she slowly only looked away, slowly began to walk away. Hey! No you don't! You won't last a day in the wasteland. Hell, it's a downright miracle you lasted this long. Get me out and I'll protect you for a month! His voice became more desperate as she continued to walk. Don't leave me here, damn it! She continued, sniffling and moving forward. Logical Lexi was very faint in her heart, but demanded she turn back. Other Lexis was as well, told her to go back. But the only thing that wanted to keep her walking away was the realization that Equestria was gone. Whatever this horrible nightmare was, it was certainly not Equestria. A year then! Damn it! Don't leave me! You bitch! If you do this and I'm dead, you're killing me! This is why your stupid country died. You ponies could not get your heads out of your asses. Screwing off until you die. Stubborn ass pieces of sh- He erupted into a coughing and bloody spray out of a fine mist in his breath. He didn't see her stop. He didn't see her fall to her knees and start to cry. Something along the lines of philosophical Lexi nudged her, yelling into her ear. He's right. This is not the equestria we lived in. It's not the equestria we loved. This? What she was doing. If she kept walking, she could not truly call herself equestrian. She had no right to be pained by the loss of this world. She left if she would not just turn around and embrace this wasteland in some vain attempt to get it all back. 
This horrible wasteland was not something she could punish, and just leave some pony to die was not how a pony acted. Her mother always told her the stories of six brave mares who acted with honesty, generosity, kindness, and more. Those stories and that culture was what made her equestrian. She stopped and wiped her eyes. Kroos had only just finished coughing and resigned to his futile struggle. He slumped forward. Even though his arm was free, he had very limited range with it. He even needed to really stress the limits of his mobility to aim low enough to hit the ranger in the back of the head. And this was why he opened his eyes in confusion, when his talons hit the ground in front of him. Lexicon had pulled the rock away and rolled it over to use as a fulcrum for a large tree branch she was using to get into position. It took a bit, but she got into position. Crow stared over at her, many emotions cleared running through him. Surprise and anger were pretty high on the list. Well, I'm quite happy you changed your mind. His voice still showed he was a little more than just angry at her. She sniffed and rubbed her eye before wiping her nose. <laughs> well, a year with a tough griffin mercenary as my servant. That sounds like it's worth some time. She did her best to laugh, even though it was still going to be a little while before she was at 100% again. With a quick heave, the smaller earth pony popped up on the makeshift lever, and the wreckage lifted a fair amount. The griffin let out a yelp and crawled out as fast as he could manage. As quick as he could, the moment he was out, he pulled two bright purple bottles from his bags and drank them down. She hadn't noticed or even thought about it at first, but having a large cage fall on you like that would hurt you in more than just the way of pain. She watched as Kroos's left paw turned and contorted back into what looked like proper shape for a griffin's paw. That looks pretty bad. You sure a couple of potions will do it? She gave a concerned look, and he laughed. Oh, I'm fine. I've had worse, and I'll have worse. It's all part of the job. He stretched, and his joints popped loudly. I am pretty durable. As you should know, a griffin is always up to the job. Speaking of which, I won't lie and say I'm not pissed off at you. I could claim that you forced me into a contract against my will. But I did say a year, so until that time passes, I guess I'm your fucking bodyguard, you stupid mud pony. He snorted, something between annoyance and relief over his features. Well, maybe you'll die before that and I'll be free. You mud ponies always seem eager to get yourselves killed. She wanted to tell him to stop calling her that, but with the knowledge of her nearly leaving him to die literally just seconds before, her mind decided against it. And from the look on his face, she felt he might not accept if she apologized at the moment either. She would have to wait until such a time where he thought she was not just a, a saying that to get him off her back. Still, rather put off by her own actions and thoughts, she needed to say something, though Kroos appeared to take the lead. We have to get out of here, and fast. That stable's not far away. And I'm honestly surprised that they have not figured out I was lying and come back yet. But I have to get to my safe room. There's stuff in there that I need. She looked at him. Then, seeing his are you serious stare, she stomped her hooves like an upset filly. Well, you gave them the code to get in, and more than just one of them heard it. They will come here. They will kill us both, and they will take your shit. Or, we both leave now, and they only take your shit. Okay? He stared down at her, but just as her mind was teetering on trying to reason with him and submitting, the young griffin's eyes shot wide and he let out a groan. Or we can just wait around too long. There was a soft shoof. And instantly, Kroos tackled Lexicon and, just as fast, dashed away from the camp. She would have asked about the sound, but his actions rather spelled it out for her, and she nearly expected the heavy booming explosion that enveloped the ground white where they just were. But with how fast they were blasting through the ruins, she felt confident that they would get away, even if she was strangely a little more upset at not getting to her library. Fuck! Kroos stopped hard letting Lexicon plow into his rear hard enough for her to pitch forward and roll over him. However, he took the opportunity to roll with her. Then, with a firm kick of his paws and a rapid flapping of his wings, 
Lexicon watched in horror as she was propped into the air, right in front of a ranger whose do milli guns were already spinning and beginning to fire. Thankfully, the weapons were aimed solidly at where they were going to before Kroos pulled his maneuver and had not yet adjusted for the griffin's quick thinking. Before she even touched the ground, Kroos's pistol pinged off the ranger's thick front facing armor and dug tiny holes into the ranger's joints. It did relatively little until a hole popped through the visor. The ranger's guns went wild but quickly died as they fell to the ground. There was an annoyed grumble from Kroos as he patted himself down and cursed silently. Finally, he slammed another magazine into the handle of his pistol and racked the slide. Almost instantly, he was upon her and pulling her along again. But he stopped to look at the ranger again and smiled. Sweet. We're gonna make it. Look at his back. He gestured with his pistol at some severe damage to the ranger's rump. It was almost repaired, but it was clearly combat damage. They didn't get back until now because they were fighting something. Now, whether that means they still are or not, it's undetermined. But it does mean that it makes sense that only one struck us. Like here. And only one's here. They must have taken casualties. Their numbers are reduced. We can probably even take our time leaving. He chuckled happily, and Lexi still breathed heavily. Fighting half to death, with the fighting and death, not to mention that she was still completely overwhelmed by literally everything. Can we go to my library? She asked, still shaking. She wanted to have something familiar around her badly, even if she knew it was a lie. She wanted to sit in her chair, hug her books to her breast, and can pretend Equestria was still out here, and this was all just a bad dream. Her focus in the very beginning of Gross's repeated no was interrupted by a torrent of gunfire just a ways away. Gross looked to be ready to haul her off again, but nothing around them appeared to be affected by the weapon's discharge. He paused and listened carefully. Only one ammo type. There was a mare's scream of pain that was cut short, and Gross gave a weary smile. Melee fighter? Sounds like they're tearing the rangers up with ease. Half a steel ranger landed like so much tin covered wet meat just a yard from them. Kroos turned a bit pale. Let's get the hell out of here right now. That's not a pony fighting with them. It's got to be a pack of hellhounds or something bigger. He grabbed onto her again and quickly took off, dragging her along as fast as he could go. However, a shadow passed overhead as if by instinct. He threw Lexicon onto a nearby shed and instantly joined her. Popping out his clip and feeding another with orange banded bullets, his eyes looked panicked as he seemed to hold himself together pretty well. Lexicon looked him over, still in shock of course, but this was the first time she really got a good look at him. He was quite young, he easily had some growing to do, and on top of that he seemed extremely focused. Scared out of his head, but very focused. This put her off even more. Despite his lack of losing it and freaking out, she did not seem like I'd like to see this young griffin so scared. He didn't even look like this when she was leaving to die. He just seemed angry and a little desperate then. She watched as he stood on his paws, his eyes straight as ever, glaring down the barrel of his heavy pistol, gripped in both his talons. It was leveled so perfectly at the door to the shack, the ears of not being kind to the small rusty shack. They stood inside, silently, as a tomb, save for both their heavy chests and lexicon's shaking legs. There was barely any light at all, filtering through the rusty holes of the sheet metal shack. Gross? She squeaked, hoping that he would say something to calm her fright. Shh! He nearly hissed as his aim faltered, as if second-guessing himself. She didn't want to be quiet. She wanted to scream and cry. Cry until she woke up from this terrible nightmare. Her mind reaching for anything she could to calm herself down. She settled on being thankful for the young griffin for pulling her along. He could have been long gone by now if he just flew off and let her die. She chewed on her bottom lip in fright, hoping and praying that he would say something, anything. But he stayed still as death aiming at the door. It was only now that he seemed to have only one paw holding all his weight, 
as the other paw was barely touching the ground, as if waiting for something. And that something seemed to come a lot faster than it appeared he was ready for. A hole exploded through the rusty metal sheet, directly to his right, and a massive set of claws wrapped over Kroos' chest and one of his arms. In one swift motion, whatever it was, tore him clean through the wall and squeezed him like a toy. There was a loud, wet crack of his arm snapping, followed by what almost sounded like firecrackers, when, she could imagine, was his ribs. His scream only lasted for a second before the beast threw him into a tree and reached back into the shack. The massive claws tightened around her head and tore her out as well, though it was now that she could see clearly through her glasses, still miraculously rested on her nose. They were not claws holding her, but talons. She looked up at the gargantuan creature, a griffin with piercing brown predator eyes, easily eight times the size of Kroos. Its dark brown feathers barely hid its extensive bulky muscles. Muscles that controlled the talons now wrapped over her head. She watched in terror as the tendons under the thick, scaly talons became taut, and the pressure over her head began to grow. Lexicon the librarian did the only thing she could, though instinct of being basic prey and little else in fight. She screamed. Footnote. Level 2 achieved. Perk added. Smarticles. You may not know how to hack terminals, pick locks, or upgrade guns, but you can certainly understand how such things would be approached. Plus five to all intelligence-related skills.